Welcome to the end of HCI 5. I've had a ton of fun teaching this class and seeing all of the great ideas that you've shared online and posted on the forums and done in your project work. And I wanted to share with you some of my reflections from teaching the class. To start off, we had more than 20,000 people who not only signed up, but hopped on and watched videos and participated in the class. We had uh, almost 7,000 people submit quizzes as part of the classwork, and more than 1,000 people who were actively involved in the studio track completing assignments, both in English uh, and in Spanish. And about half of those folks uh, got all the way through all six of the assignments. The students in this class comprised 174 countries of all ages, it's been a real honor to teach such a global class, and when I pick up the newspaper every morning, I think about all of you in countries all over the world, and so I hope all of you who are watching this video today are doing well, and you and your families are, are safe and happy. In this class, you learn skills for a lot of things, including need finding and observation, how to go out and see what people actually do, and this is so important for design because Often we tell stories about what we think people do, and what you've learned in this class is to see what it is that people are actually doing. Then you learn how to take what you saw out in the real world and convert those into storyboards and make rapid prototypes. And this is a powerful part of the designer's tool belt because you're able to quickly make new designs and bring new things into the world. And these prototypes are both powerful instantiations of your ideas and also really important anchors for conversations with other stakeholders in a design project. And you learn lots of ways to evaluate interfaces, both formatively really early on and then summatively at the end of the project. So here we see a couple of student projects, one that's more desktop based, one that's more mobile based on a bicycle. I'm going on a bike ride tomorrow. I'll be looking forward to trying this app out. And what you see here are Lots of ways for getting feedback about what people are actually doing with the user interface. And by doing this in person, in addition to online, you get to see the, what happens there for yourself. You also learn great principles for visual and information design. How to take the ideas that you have, lay them out on a screen in a way that's intuitive and easy to understand. I really appreciate all the, all the praise for the lectures, uh, for the ability to do creative open-ended work, and be able to see what your peers are up to. That's really exciting. And we saw tons of positive feedback for the community TAs, and I really appreciate the huge amount of work they put into it as volunteers for this class. And maybe some of you will return next time to join us as community TAs. Things that you told us that we could do a better job of next time, including how do we get more and more flexible peer assessment? And this has turned into a research project in my group called Peer Studio that we're trying with a number of classes and, and hope to be able to bring to HCI for the next time. Uh, you wanted to be able to have a chance to do the training before you do the assignment, which makes a lot of sense to me. And also alternative pacing options, which is something that I and Coursera have had a lot of conversations about. There's a real tension here. On one hand, there's a huge social cohort effect of being able to do this with a lot of your peers. And on the other hand, there's the ability and power of being able to do this when you want it at the right pace for you. And so that's one thing that we've thought a lot about. And stay tuned for, for more options there where, where uh, we're exploring. One of the things that we did that was new this time was the weekly Twitter challenges and it was great for me to see the setting in which you learn and all of the sketches you made and all of the design ideas that you had and what I see about social media like Twitter is that uh, 10 people who share some of their ideas on Twitter can enrich the experience for thousands and that's a really interesting way to leverage the global nature of the class here. So what should we be doing here in the future? Are there different challenges we should offer or things that we should do differently or just keep up what we're doing. One of the most meaningful things for me was how you made this class yours. I mean on the forums, on Twitter, on Facebook, you shared great interfaces and resources, useful articles. Uh, you collated these into reading lists and made community pages. You helped each other with assignment aids to improve the quality of the assignment projects and, and these are all things that will help 
assimilate into the class and make it better for the next, next time. You did things like host Google Hangouts and have in-person meetups. We just had our end of class meetup today. And uh, you can see the picture here from our group of uh, everybody who joined us in San Diego at the Design Lab. It was wonderful to talk to the students here. And most importantly, you did this really great creative work and helped other students do creative work. And we saw this in particular with the uh, heuristic evaluation feedback and answering forum questions. All of you who did extra peer assessment, I know how time consuming that is. And when I look on the dashboard and I see students that are going above and beyond, you know, I find that really meaningful. And uh, it's great to see you give back and hopefully you're getting something out of it as well. Certainly karma. Talking to students in person today and seeing the great work that you've done in, in class, it really conveyed to me people talking about, you know, I put 30, 40 hours a week at, at the end of the class and, you know, stayed up till 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. It's really amazing and it shows in the outcome of these projects. And so I encourage you, you know, make a portfolio website, share that portfolio website with us, post it to Twitter with the HCI5 hashtag, put it on the forum, uh, put it on your blog, put it on Facebook. You know, you put so much effort into this class and uh, the projects are really great. And so get those out into the world and, uh, and get credit for them, get feedback, see what happens. There's a number of questions that you had and I wanted to answer a couple of them here. One of them is, um, a lot of people have told me how they really enjoyed this class and they want to go further, do more. And so what's next? What are some other opportunities? We've been talking with Coursera about being able to expand out our offerings in in this space and so stay tuned for some some news there we're, we're hoping to be able to say something soon also there are other online classes uh, that other universities offer in the design area that I think are really great and uh, definitely check those out um, and for some of you that's going to mean a, a master's program but you do also have the opportunity to continue these local meetups join us on the LinkedIn group for those of you that got a certificate in the class and there's lots of ways to continue reaching out and learning more. That's a real blessing of the Internet age. Another question we got is, what's the difference between HCI, user experience, interaction design, and human factors? And um, there isn't a bright line that separates these. Sometimes they're used interchangeably. Um, they come from different places. The word human-computer interaction comes out of the academic research community and trying to understand what the human side of technology is like and bu building on what we know from cognitive psychology in particular, but the social sciences more broadly, to understand what the human side of, of the equation is. User experience is more focused on the um, creation of, of new designs and it's intentionally broad. I think the term may have come from when Don Norman was at Apple uh, in the 90s and wanted a way of describing very broadly how it is that we create, well, compelling user experiences. And so that's where that term comes from. Interaction design, I think, was coined by Bill Verplank by analogy to the traditional design fields of graphic design and industrial design. And it emphasizes how what we're designing here are interactive experiences. Human factors comes out of the mid-century industrial engineering and looking at the human side of not only computer systems, but engineering systems more generally. And uh, ergonomics is an example of this. And so human factors is often focused on the analysis of engineered systems, which could be computers, could be factories, could be uh, airplane seats or anything like that, and reminding the designers that there are human abilities and limitations and we need to, to take those into account. Why did I decide to teach this class? I, I think there's several reasons. One is that I've always been really excited about teaching design. I love seeing the work that students come up with. I like being able to figure out how to take a a really hairy and multifarious field and come up with aspects of it that I think are especially important and be able to present those to people in a way that's understandable. It's a kind of interface design. And the opportunity to do that uh, beyond the ivory tower was, was really exciting for me. It was a huge amount of work. Uh, it's amazing how translating a class, even though much of the material, not all of it, but a lot of it is stuff I've been teaching for a number of years, 
and it seems like it wouldn't be that much of a transformation to put it online. It was, uh, it was a lot of work, but, uh, but also a lot of fun, and I learned a lot by doing it. And one of the biggest changes in teaching this class is that I see how students, you know, if you're um, right now in America, if you're an 18 to 22 year old upper middle class student, the opportunities that you have for education are, are really enormous. And if you're anything other than that, it can be really hard to, to get a chance to experience the cutting edge of knowledge, even in the age of the internet. And one of the main things that I learned from teaching this class is the diverse perspectives that people all around the world bring. And it, may, it sounds kind of hokey when you say it like that, but it's, it's real and, and it shows up in ways like age variation that many of the students I teach in my undergraduate class are 20, 20 years old plus or minus two. Seeing students who are 40 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, who are parents with young kids, who are people who are retiring and thinking about an encore career. Those are really different settings for thinking about what designs you want to make. And it's really fun to, to see what people come up with. Similarly, thinking about the different cultural perspectives that come from having students around the globe, that what makes sense in Beijing is different than what makes sense in Nebraska. And seeing how users with different abilities, many people who are taking online classes, don't have the opportunity to leave the house or have mobility restrictions. And thinking about what human-centered design means for people who have different abilities, I think, uh, for me, it's really enlightening and really rewarding. But also, in a, in a citizenship sense, I think it's really important that everybody have access to this and that people from all backgrounds participate in design. And so there's an activist part to this, which I didn't really expect, but I, I've come to really believe in. I think it's really important, and it's wonderful to see all of you taking up this challenge and, and learning this material. Here's a couple of projects that I thought were especially exciting, and uh, I bet all of you do too. There were a bunch of cooking and food-related apps in the class, and one that I liked a lot was Nom Nom, which has a really slick user interface design, and it creates personalized recommendations based on skill level, of what you like to eat, and it helps you work towards uh, goals for cooking more at home. Nom Nom tackled the creation side of cooking at home, Here's an app, Don't Waste Your Food, that tackles the waste challenge of reminding people how much food society wastes every day and thinking about ways of being able to do a better job of making sure all of the food that we make goes to good use. I love to travel and get outside, and here's an app, Trek King, which helps make it easy to get a bunch of trekking information all in one place and connect with other people who are interested in that. So congratulations to these three and all of the apps that, uh, that you created. These are super cool, and I'm excited to see where they go from here. Definitely continue posting and uh, let us know what happens. Also, we wanted to give a community service award to Anna for her amazing sketch notes, and you can see them online at sketchnotespace.com. They're super cool. I want to figure out a way to be able to use them in the class in the future. They're uh, not only beautiful, but also these really wonderful summaries of all of the material. And uh, if you haven't seen them yet, you should definitely check them out. There's a, a lot of people we owe a, a thank you card to. And first and foremost, the teaching staff, Nobu and Lolita and Catherine, you know how hard the three of them worked. And they make it possible for this course to be run. And uh, really, they were the ones who said, all right, let's do this again. It's time to run the class. we got to do it. So. Thank you to the three of them, and also to the community TAs who answered your questions on the forum, helped with creating projects and giving feedback. They just did an, an awesome job. Rhett came down to the meetup earlier this afternoon, and the energy from the community TAs is just great. Uh, definitely my colleagues at UC San Diego and Stanford have been wonderful in supporting this class, making it possible for us to offer this for free and use the university resources to do that. And similarly, Jenny and Coursera have done a great job of posting this class for five times, creating software, helping us troubleshoot, doing all sorts of stuff, and just pushing us to, to make the class better. Uh, Brian and friends at, at Webflow and all the software platforms that we use for this class, we really appreciate 
making those available to students. And my colleagues who let me show their work uh, in this class as demonstrations, I, I really appreciate that. So if you haven't seen the end of course survey yet, now's a great time to fill it out. We really do revise the course after, after every offering. And if you think there are things that we did well, let us know. If there's things that we can do better, let us know. Uh, we'll be sending out the Statement of Accomplishments imminently. Stay tuned for that. And uh, if you want to know more about what's going on with HCI Research, we have a series called Design at Large. It returns on October 1st with Sebastian Thrun of Udacity. And you can watch these videos online at d.ucsd.edu. Uh, all the videos from last year are archived. They're wonderful uh, perspectives from the very cutting edge of the field, thinking about how design in the, in the 21st century is really at scale, embedded in the world, and sometimes subversive in changing our values and changing our culture in new and interesting ways. Also, we're going to email you the next time the class is, is offered or as we expand our online offerings, and so watch your inbox. You'll definitely hear from us again.